The Watchtower, December 1st, 2012. This issue of The Watchtower opens with the cover series entitled Something Better Than Christmas. You'll hear seven articles entitled In Search of the Christmas Spirit, Remembering Jesus Christ, The Joy of Giving, Helping the Needy, Family Togetherness, Peace Among Men of Goodwill, and They Found Something Better. Our program continues with Our Readers Ask, Why Do Some People Not Celebrate Christmas? and Draw Close to God, Are You in God's Book of Remembrance? Followed by the life story of Maria Keelan entitled At Last I Found True Freedom and Learn from God's Word, Why Did God Send Jesus to Earth? Next come, Do You Believe That You Have Lived Before? and did you know? Followed by A Letter from Benin, The Use of Cosmetics in Bible Times, and History Does Not Lie. Finally, you'll hear Teach Your Children, Jotham Remained Faithful Despite Troubles at Home. Our program begins now with the cover series Something Better Than Christmas, and the first article In Search of the Christmas Spirit. It's easy to get caught up in the hubbub of the season. Holiday traditions become tasks to check off a list. Time with family and friends can be cut short by busy schedules. The joy we should experience is sometimes obscured by the stress we do experience. Former Oklahoma, USA Governor Brad Henry, December 23, 2008 As the Christmas season approaches, songs, films, and TV programs promote a jolly and exciting holiday mood, the Christmas spirit. What do you think should be the most important element of that spirit? Would it be remembering Jesus Christ, sharing in the joy of giving, helping the needy, spending time with family, or promoting peace? As Governor Henry quoted earlier put it, Many who celebrate Christmas find it difficult to achieve any of those goals during the holiday season. Christmas time often tends to be hectic, stressful, and above all, commercial. Is cultivating the Christmas spirit, or at least what it is supposed to be, a lost cause? The Bible does encourage all of us to remember Jesus Christ, to be liberal in giving, to help the needy, and to spend time with our families. It also teaches us how to be peaceable. Therefore, rather than discuss why some do not celebrate Christmas, this series of articles will consider the following questions. What do some feel should be the reason for celebrating Christmas? Why is it a challenge to achieve what they hope for in Christmas? What Bible principles have helped millions to find something better than Christmas? End of article. Remembering Jesus Christ Keep doing this in remembrance of me. Luke 22.19 A reason why some celebrate Christmas Regarding Christmas, some say that Jesus is the reason for the season. They celebrate Christmas to commemorate His birthday. Why is it a challenge? Popular Christmas music and many Christmas customs have little to do with Jesus Christ. Millions who celebrate the holiday do not put faith in Him. Some do not even believe that He existed. In the commercial world, Christmas has become a holiday to advertise goods rather than an occasion to remember Jesus. What Bible principles can help? The Son of Man came to give His soul a ransom in exchange for many. Mark 10.45 Jesus spoke the words quoted at the beginning of this article, obviously not on his birthday, but on the night before he died. On that evening, he instituted a simple ceremony to memorialize his death. Yet, why would Jesus want his followers to remember his death rather than his birth? Because Jesus' ransom sacrifice gives obedient humans the opportunity to receive everlasting life. The wages sin pays is death, says the Bible, but the gift God gives is everlasting life by Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23
Thus, each year on the anniversary of his death, Jesus' followers remember Jesus Christ not as a helpless infant, but as the Savior of the world. John 4.42 Christ suffered for you, leaving you a model for you to follow his steps closely. 1 Peter 2.21 To honor and remember Jesus, you should study his example as a perfect, intelligent man. Also, meditate on the way Jesus displayed compassion, patience, and the courage to do what is right, and look for opportunities to imitate him in your own life. The kingdom of the world did become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule as king forever and ever. Revelation 11.15 When you remember Jesus Christ, consider what he is doing now. Jesus is ruling as a heavenly king. God's word prophesied regarding Jesus, With righteousness he must judge the lowly ones, and with uprightness he must give reproof in behalf of the meek ones of the earth. Isaiah 11.4 Those appealing qualities belong not to a newborn baby, but to a mighty ruler. End of article. The Joy of Giving There is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. Acts 20.35 A Reason Why Some Celebrate Christmas As Jesus stated, giving makes both the giver and the receiver happy. In pursuit of that happiness, many view gift-giving as one of the most important features of Christmas. Even during last year's economic crisis, One survey found, for example, that in Ireland, each household expected to spend over 500 euros, or about $660 U.S., on Christmas gifts. Why is it a challenge? Many feel that Christmas gift-giving brings more stress, not more happiness. How so? A lot of shoppers feel compelled to buy gifts that they cannot afford. And since everyone is shopping for gifts at the same time, crowds and long lines make shopping an exasperating experience for many. What Bible principles can help? Practice giving, said Jesus. Luke 6.38 The footnote reads, Some Bible translations simply say, give. In the original Greek, however, the verb form denotes continuous action. To convey the full sense of the word that Jesus used, the New World Translation renders it, practice giving. And a footnote. He did not limit gift giving to a certain time of the year when people would be expected to give. Jesus urged his followers to make spontaneous gift giving a practice, a way of life. Let each one do just as he is resolved in his heart not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9.7 The essence of Paul's counsel is that nothing is ever to be given from compulsion, from a feeling that one is forced to give, explains one Bible commentary. Being a cheerful giver rules out the feeling of being obligated to give a specific item to a specific person at a specific time, the way Christmas gift-giving often turns out to be. If the readiness is there first, it is especially acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person does not have. 2 Corinthians 8.12 God does not require Christians to go into debt to pay for expensive gifts. Rather, when a person gives according to what he has, his gifts are not merely tolerable, but especially acceptable. What a refreshing contrast to the buy-now-pay-later message of advertisers during the holidays. End of article. Helping the Needy He that is kindly an eye will be blessed, for he has given of his food to the lowly one. Proverbs 22.9 A Reason Why Some Celebrate Christmas Because Jesus helped people who were poor, sick, and afflicted, some want to follow his example. 
They feel that the best time to do that may be Christmas, when charities often put forth extra effort to collect donations. Why is it a challenge? During the holidays, many people are preoccupied with shopping, entertaining, and visiting friends and family. All of this leaves them with little time, energy, or money to attend to the poor and needy, other than perhaps making a donation. What Bible principles can help? Do not hold back good from those to whom it is owing, when it happens to be in the power of your hand to do it. Proverbs 3.27 The poor, the hungry, and the afflicted do not suffer only at Christmas time. If you perceive that someone needs help and it is within the power of your hand to assist, why wait for a holiday to act? Your kindness and compassionate actions will be blessed. Every first day of the week, let each of you at his own house set something aside in store as he may be prospering. 1 Corinthians 16.2 The Apostle Paul gave that advice to early Christians who wanted to help the poor. Could you set aside or budget some money that you can regularly give to individuals or to an organization that uses its funds wisely? In this way, you ensure that you care for the needy while still giving within your means. Do not forget the doing of good and the sharing of things with others, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Hebrews 13.16 Notice that besides the sharing of things with others, we must also remember the doing of good, or helpful acts. For example, wise parents train their children to help the elderly with everyday tasks, to encourage the sick by means of a card, a visit, or a phone call, and to take a personal interest in other children who are poor or suffer from a disability. As a result, children learn to be kind and generous year-round. End of article. Family Togetherness Look, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133.1 A reason why some celebrate Christmas. Since the Israelites were all descendants of one man, Jacob or Israel, they were brothers members of one family. When they assembled for festivals in Jerusalem, it was good and pleasant. Like them, many families today look forward to getting together and enjoying a good and pleasant time at Christmas. Why is it a challenge? The Encyclopedia of Christmas and New Year's celebrations acknowledges family tensions that simmer below the surface during the rest of the year very often boil over when the family gathers together for the holidays. What Bible principles can help? Keep paying a due compensation to your parents and grandparents. 1 Timothy 5.4 To the extent possible, arrange regular visits with your family. If your relatives live far away, you can still communicate often. Why not write a letter? Call them on the telephone. Send an email or chat online. Regular communication keeps misunderstandings to a minimum. You are cramped for room in your own tender affections. Widen out. 2 Corinthians 6, 12 and 13 Relatives seen only once a year can quickly become strangers, especially for children. Some children feel that they have little in common with their grandparents or distant relatives. Therefore, encourage your children to widen out in their affections by including elderly relatives. Children who regularly spend time with elderly people tend to develop more empathy and appreciation for people who are older than they are. Saying the right word at the right time is so pleasing. Proverbs 15.23 New Century Version How can you prevent misunderstandings or issues from straining family relationships? One way is to select the right time to discuss legitimate concerns. If your relationship is lubricated by regular communication, you will find it easier to approach family members privately to resolve any problems 
and enjoy good and pleasant times when you come together. End of article. Peace among men of good will. Glory in the heights above to God and upon earth peace among men of good will. Luke 2.14 A reason why some celebrate Christmas. Every year, the Pope and other religious leaders preach messages of peace, hopeful that the Christmas season will fulfill the angelic proclamation, Upon earth, peace among men of good will. Some make special pilgrimages to celebrate. Why is it a challenge? Peace during Christmas time is temporary at best. For example, in December 1914, while Europe was engulfed in World War I, British and German soldiers emerged from the trenches and celebrated Christmas together. They shared food, drink, and cigarettes. They even played soccer. However, the truce did not last long. In a letter from the front lines, a British soldier related that a German soldier told him, Today we have peace. Tomorrow, you fight for your country, I fight for mine. What Bible principles can help? There has been a child born to us. His name will be called Prince of Peace. To the abundance of the princely rule and to peace there will be no end. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 Is not that prophecy about Jesus Christ reassuring? Jesus was not born on earth to bring one day of peace each year. As a heavenly ruler, he will bring genuine peace that will not end. By means of me, Jesus, you may have peace. In the world you are having tribulation, but take courage. I have conquered the world. John 16.33 Even today, Jesus nurtures peace among his followers. True, Christians have tribulation. Yet, thanks to the Bible, they understand why suffering exists and how Jesus will bring lasting peace. Therefore, they enjoy peace of mind. By following Jesus' words, Jehovah's Witnesses, regardless of their nationality, skin color, ethnicity, or language, enjoy such peace. See for yourself by attending a meeting at their kingdom hall. Perhaps you, like many others, will agree that this peace is better than any peace that Christmas can offer. End of article. They found something better. Millions of Christians choose not to celebrate Christmas. How do they feel about their decision? Do they feel that they are missing out on something? Do their children feel deprived? Consider what Jehovah's Witnesses around the world say about the matter. Remembering Jesus Christ Before I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I rarely went to church. If I did go, I went only on Christmas or Easter. Yet even then, I didn't really think about Jesus Christ. I no longer celebrate Christmas, but I attend Christian meetings twice weekly, and I even teach others what the Bible says about Jesus. Eve, Australia The Joy of Giving I get excited when people give me a present when I don't expect it. I love surprises. I also like making cards and painting pictures for other people because it makes them feel a bit happier, and it makes me happy too. Reuben Northern Ireland Helping the Needy We enjoy making meals for people who are sick. Sometimes we bring them flowers, a cake, or a small gift to cheer them up. We enjoy this because we can visit these people at any time of the year. Emily, Australia Family Togetherness When our family gets together, our children get to know their uncles, aunts, grandparents, and cousins in a relaxed atmosphere. Since we are not bound by fixed holidays, we do not feel pressured, and our family knows that we visit them because we love them. Wendy, Cayman Islands Peace At Christmas time, it seems that there is so much to do that few people think about peace. 
Now that I have learned what the Bible promises for humans, I feel at ease. Now I understand that my children will enjoy a happy future. Sandra, Spain End of article Our readers ask, Why do some people not celebrate Christmas? Around the world, nearly 2 billion people celebrate Christmas each December 25th, while at least 200 million others celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ on January 7th. However, there are also millions who choose not to celebrate Christmas at all. Why? For one thing, they may belong to a religion that is not part of Christendom. They may be of the Jewish, Hindu, or Shinto faith, to name a few. Others, such as atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, or secular humanists, view the Christmas story as a myth. Surprisingly, though, a sizable number of people who believe in Jesus reject the Yuletide traditions. Why? They point to at least four reasons. First, they do not believe that Jesus was born in either December or January. The Bible does not give a specific date. It simply states, There were also in that same country shepherds living out of doors and keeping watches in the night over their flocks. And suddenly Jehovah's angel stood by them. And the angel said to them, There was born to you today a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Luke 2, 8-11 Facts point to Jesus' birth at approximately the beginning of October, when shepherds with their flocks would still spend the night in the fields. The countryside around Bethlehem experiences the coldest weather during the months of December and January. Hence, to keep them warm at night, flocks are herded into protective shelters. A second reason. The only event Jesus specifically instructed his followers to commemorate was his death not his birth, and this was to be done as a simple communion meal. Note, too, that the Gospels of Mark and John are silent about Jesus' birth. A third reason. There is no historical evidence that the early Christians celebrated the birth of the Christ, but they did memorialize his death. It was not until more than 300 years after Jesus' birth that Christendom officially began to observe Christmas on December 25th. Interestingly, in the mid-17th century, an act of Parliament banned Christmas celebrations in England. In the United States, the Massachusetts General Court did the same. Why? The book, The Battle for Christmas, says, There is no biblical or historical reason to place the birth of Jesus on December 25th. It adds, that to the Puritans, Christmas was nothing but a pagan festival covered with a Christian veneer. That brings us to a fourth reason, the unsavory origin of the celebration itself. The roots of Christmas can be traced back to pagan Rome with its mixture of festivals for honoring the agricultural god Saturn and the sun god Sol Invictus, or Mithra. Anthropologists Christian Roch and Claudia muller Abling, co-authors of the book Pagan Christmas, write, Like many pre-Christian customs and beliefs, the old feast commemorating the yearly return of the sun was rededicated to the birth of Christ. In view of the foregoing, can you see why true Christians do not celebrate Christmas? End of article. Draw close to God. Are you in God's book of remembrance? Does Jehovah notice the efforts of his worshipers to please him? Yes, he does. But he observes more than their godly deeds and words of praise. He takes note even when they think appreciatively about him. What is more, Jehovah will never forget his people and what they have done. How can we be sure? The answer is found in words recorded by the prophet Malachi. Malachi 3.16 reads, At that time those in fear of Jehovah spoke with one another, each one with his companion. And Jehovah kept paying attention and listening. And a book of remembrance began to be written up before him for those in fear of Jehovah 
and for those thinking upon his name. In the 5th century BCE, when Malachi prophesied, moral and religious conditions in Israel were appalling. The priests neglected their duties, and the people in general took up such God-dishonoring practices as sorcery, adultery, and fraud. In the midst of such corruption, however, there was a core of Israelites who remained loyal. What were they doing? Those in fear of Jehovah spoke with one another, explains Malachi. Fear of God is a positive quality. Malachi here describes Israelites who had a profound respect for God, coupled with a healthy dread of displeasing Him. Note that those God-fearing individuals spoke with one another. Evidently, they got together to speak well of Jehovah and encourage one another, lest they become disheartened or tainted by the corruption around them. The faithful Israelites showed their reverence for Jehovah in another meaningful way. They were thinking upon His name. Another translation says, esteeming His name. Those God-fearing ones honored Jehovah even in their thoughts. In the privacy of their heart, they thought appreciatively or meditated on Jehovah and His great name. Was Jehovah aware of what they were doing? Malachi says, Jehovah kept paying attention and listening. From His lofty abode in heaven, Jehovah in effect inclined His ear and heard every word of praise that His worshippers spoke to one another. He also paid attention to all their private meditations. But He did more than just pay attention to their good words and thoughts. A book of remembrance began to be written up before Him, notes Malachi. That book is a record of all those who have served Jehovah in integrity. Notice that it is called a book of remembrance. The footnote reads, The Hebrew word for remembrance means more than just calling something to mind. It can also imply doing something about what is remembered. End of footnote. That tells us that Jehovah will never forget His faithful worshipers and all that they have done to praise Him, every good deed, word, and thought. But God remembers them for a reason. He promises to reward with everlasting life those whose names are indelibly recorded in His book of remembrance. How comforting it is to know that Jehovah values all that we do to worship Him acceptably. The words at Malachi 3.16 give us cause for sober reflection. We do well to ask, Is my name in God's book of remembrance? It will be if we do our best to act, speak, and think each day in ways that Jehovah will want to remember. Suggested Bible Reading for December Nahum 1 through Malachi 4 End of article At last, i found true freedom. The Life Story of Maria Keelan No one is asking for you, an officer of the prison said with a laugh. You can stay here. How did we, a hard-working, peaceful Russian family, end up as prisoners in North Korea in 1950, some five years after the end of World War II? According to my documents, I was born in 1924. My birthplace was evidently the village of Shmakova, in the far east of Russia, near the Chinese border. One day, my father and my older brothers were taken away by bandits, and mother never saw them again. She was left with a houseful of younger children, whom she could barely feed. A neighbor offered to take us young ones to the Russian Orthodox orphanage and say that mother had abandoned us. Mother agreed with this plan because her young ones, including me, would probably have starved to death if she hadn't. Now that I am in my mid-eighties, I am grateful that mother sent us to the orphanage. It probably saved our lives. Still, her decision continues to haunt me. In 1941, I moved to Korea, where I married a kind Russian man named Ivan. Our daughter, Olya, was born in Seoul, Korea, in 1942. 
Our son, Kolya, was born there in 1945, and his brother, Jora, in 1948. My husband cared for our family store, and I took in sewing. Because Seoul had been occupied by the Japanese, our children grew up speaking Japanese, although we spoke Russian at home. Until 1950, there seemed to be peace among the Soviets, Americans, and Koreans in Seoul. All of them were customers at our store. Captured by the North Koreans Like a thunderclap, everything changed in 1950. North Korean troops took control of Seoul. Unable to flee, we were arrested along with other foreign civilians. For three and a half years, we were marched with British, Russian, American, and French prisoners of war to various locations all over North Korea. We were housed wherever there was shelter, and we tried to avoid the bombs. On occasion, we lived in houses with heat, and were given enough food. Usually, however, we had only millet to eat and slept in cold, abandoned buildings. Many of our group died of malnutrition and neglect. I was frantic when my children suffered. Winter came early in North Korea. I remember sitting by the fire all night, heating stones to place under the children. When it got warmer, some Korean villagers taught us which wild plants were edible, and we foraged for greens, raspberries, grapes, and mushrooms. Clearly, the villagers felt no hatred toward us, only pity for our plight. I learned how to catch frogs to supplement our meager diet. It broke my heart to hear my children constantly begging for frogs. One October, we were ordered to march to Manpo. We were told that ox carts would be provided for the sick and the small children. Olya and her father were marched off with the group on foot. Her little brothers and I waited anxiously for days for the carts to arrive. Eventually, they did. Sick prisoners were piled on the carts like stacks of grain. It was a horrible sight. With little Jora on my back, I tried to place Kolya on a corner of a cart, but he burst out crying, Mama, Mama, I want to walk with you. Please don't leave me. Kolya trailed behind, one little fist clutching at my skirt, while he trotted to keep up. Many prisoners were shot during this infamous march, which lasted for days. Flocks of crows followed, picking at the corpses that were left behind. Finally, we were reunited with my husband and Olya. We wept and embraced. That night, I stayed awake and warmed stones by the fire. Since I was now putting them under all my children, I was at peace. In 1953, near the 38th parallel that divides North and South Korea, our lives became somewhat easier. We received clean uniforms, shoes, bread, and even candy. Soon, the British were released, and then the French. But we were citizens of no country. When the last prisoners were gone, we were alone. We wept in despair and could not eat. It was then that the Korean officer said the hurtful words quoted in the introduction. The following is supplementary information. A compelling story. Late in 1954, Maria Keelan wrote down a compelling account of her life in North Korea. It was translated into English by a Russian worker at the Australian Embassy and sold to a newspaper in the United States. It ran in 12 installments, from January 16 to 28, 1955. The first installment began with the words, I am not a writer. Perhaps I cannot write my story adeptly. But I can write it completely, and I can write it truthfully. 
and Maria did. The accompanying article provides a brief account of Maria's life, including the dramatic change that occurred years after she arrived in the United States. Returning to the article, A New Life in the United States Surprisingly, not long afterward, we were taken across the demilitarized zone into South Korea. Following interrogation by American military personnel, we were allowed to immigrate to the United States. We made our way by ship to San Francisco, California, where we were assisted by a charitable organization. Later, we moved to Virginia, and acquaintances there kindly helped us to get on our feet. Eventually, we moved to Maryland to begin a new life. We were overwhelmed by simple things, such as a vacuum cleaner. As immigrants in a new country, we worked long and hard. But I was saddened to see ones who were doing well in their new environment taking advantage of new arrivals. Soon after we arrived, we met a Russian Orthodox priest who said, You are on blessed land now. If you want to progress, don't be with your own kind. I was shocked and puzzled. Shouldn't we help one another? In 1970, a man named Bernie Battleman, one of Jehovah's Witnesses, called at our door to discuss something from the Bible. He was a strong, outspoken person, just like one of us. We talked for hours. Because I had grown up in an Orthodox orphanage, I knew the church liturgy by heart. But never did I think of owning a Bible. Bernie brought us one and said, This Bible is for you because I love you. He also introduced us to Ben, a Russian-speaking witness from Belarus. Ben and his wife kindly answered my questions from the Bible. I was sure, though, that the witnesses had distorted the holy text. I was especially incensed that their publication said that Mary had children other than Jesus when the church taught otherwise. I called up a Polish friend and asked her to look at her Polish Bible to see what it said at Matthew thirteen fifty-five and 56. When she read me the verse, I was shocked to learn that Jesus did indeed have younger brothers. My friend also called up an acquaintance who worked at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., to check this verse in all the available Bible translations there. She reported that they all said the same thing. Jesus had brothers and sisters. I had so many other questions. Why do children die? Why are nations fighting? Why do people not understand one another, even when they speak the same language? The answers I received from the Bible thrilled me. I learned that suffering is not God's will for humans. I was overjoyed to learn that I would again see dear ones who had perished during various conflicts. Gradually, Jehovah became real to me. One day, I was standing before my icons, begging God for help with my son, who had just returned from combat in Vietnam and was suffering deep emotional distress. Suddenly, I realized that my prayers should be directed not to the icons, but to the living God, Jehovah. I pulled the icons apart and saw that they were nothing more than colorful tinfoil. I had bought them at the church, but that night I got rid of them. It was not easy to break from the church I had grown up with. But I had come to value what the Bible teaches above everything else. A year later, I took my daughter and my husband with me to visit the Russian Orthodox priest. I had a notepad with pages of Bible questions, with scriptures jotted under them. As I read the Bible verses out loud, the priest shook his head and said, You're lost. 
he told us never to darken his door again. This episode impressed my strong-minded inquisitive daughter, Olya. She too began examining the Bible closely and was soon attending meetings of the witnesses with me. I was baptized in 1972, and Olya was baptized the following year. Our family motto. Our motto has been, focus on the present, let go of the past. So we were never hesitant to do something new, if we were convinced that it was right. When my daughter and I began developing a relationship with God, we had a strong desire to go to people's homes and tell them what we were learning. I must admit, my outspoken, unsentimental personality meant that others would sometimes have to step in and smooth things over. But in time, I learned to talk to people of many nationalities and backgrounds who, like me, were searching for a better life. During the years that followed, my daughter and I often said that if the Iron Curtain ever fell, we would go to Russia to help people like us learn about God. When it did fall in the early 1990s, Olya fulfilled that dream for both of us. She moved to Russia and for 14 years served as a full-time minister there. She studied the Bible with many and was able to assist in translating Bible literature from English into Russian at the Russia branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now I am bedridden and my children do all that they can to make my life as comfortable as possible. I thank God that after my early years of suffering, I truly found a better life. I have come to a realization of the Bible psalm of the shepherd David. By well-watered resting places, God conducts me. My soul, he refreshes he leads me in the tracks of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, 2 and 3. The footnote reads, Maria Keelan fell asleep in death on March 1st, 2010, while this first-person account was being prepared for publication. End of article. Learn from God's Word. Why did God send Jesus to earth? This article considers questions you may have raised and shows where you can read the answers in your Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses would be pleased to discuss these answers with you. 1. Where was Jesus before God sent him to earth? Jesus lived as a spirit person in heaven before he was born in Bethlehem. He was God's first creation, and the only one created directly by God. Therefore, He is fittingly referred to as God's only begotten Son. In heaven, He often spoke as God's representative. That is why He is called the Word. He also acted as God's helper and took part in the creation of all other things. Jesus lived with God in heaven for eons before humankind was created. Micah 5.2 reads, And you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, the one too little to get to be among the thousands of Judah, from you there will come out to me the one who is to become ruler in Israel, whose origin is from early times, from the days of time indefinite. John 17.5 reads, So now you, Father, glorify me alongside yourself with the glory that I had alongside you before the world was. 2. How did God send His Son to earth? Jehovah transferred the life of Jesus from heaven to the womb of Mary by means of Holy Spirit. So Jesus was born without the aid of a human father. Angels announced His birth to some local shepherds who were living outdoors at night as they kept watch over their flocks. Thus Jesus was born not in the depths of winter, but likely in early October when the weather was still warm. Sometime later, Mary and her husband Joseph took Jesus to their home in Nazareth and raised him there. Joseph cared for Jesus as his adopted son. 
Matthew 1, 18-23 reads, But the birth of Jesus Christ was in this way. During the time his mother Mary was promised in marriage to Joseph, she was found to be pregnant by Holy Spirit before they were united. However, Joseph, her husband, because he was righteous and did not want to make her a public spectacle, intended to divorce her secretly. But after he had thought these things over, look, Jehovah's angel appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary your wife home, for that which has been begotten in her is by Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you must call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this actually came about for that to be fulfilled which was spoken by Jehovah through his prophet, saying, Look, the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means, when translated, with us is God. When Jesus was about thirty years old, he was baptized, and God publicly announced that Jesus was his son. Then Jesus began the work that God had sent him to do. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 reads, After being baptized, Jesus immediately came up from the water, and look, the heavens were opened up, and he saw descending like a dove God's Spirit coming upon him. Look, also, there was a voice from the heavens that said, This is my Son, the Beloved, whom I have approved. 3. Why did God send Jesus to earth? God sent Jesus to teach people the truth. Jesus taught about God's kingdom, a government in heaven that will bring peace to all the earth. He provided the hope of everlasting life. Jesus also taught people many things about finding real happiness. He taught by example. For instance, he showed how to do God's will even in difficult circumstances. When he was mistreated, he did not retaliate. 1 Peter 2, 21-24 reads, In fact, to this course you were called, because even Christ suffered for you, leaving you a model for you to follow his steps closely. He committed no sin, nor was deception found in his mouth. When he was being reviled, he did not go reviling in return. When he was suffering, he did not go threatening but kept on committing himself to the one who judges righteously. He himself bore our sins in his own body upon the stake, in order that we might be done with sins and live to righteousness. And by his stripes you were healed. Jesus taught his followers self-sacrificing love. He had enjoyed many privileges living in heaven with his Father, yet he humbly obeyed his Father and came to earth to live among mankind. No one could give us a finer example of love than Jesus. John 15, 12, and 13 reads, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. No one has love greater than this, that someone should surrender his soul in behalf of his friends. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 reads, Keep this mental attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he was existing in God's form, gave no consideration to a seizure, namely, that he should be equal to God. No, but he emptied himself and took a slave's form and came to be in the likeness of men. More than that, when he found himself in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient as far as death, yes, death on a torture stake. 4. What did Jesus accomplish by dying? God also sent Jesus to die for our sins. We are all sinners, meaning that we are imperfect and sinful. That is why we get sick and die. In contrast, the first man, Adam, was perfect. He had no sin and would never have died or become sick. But he lost his perfection when he disobeyed God. From Adam, we inherited sin and its wages, death. Romans 5.12 reads, That is why, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because they had all sinned. Romans 6.23 reads, For the wages sin pays is death, 
but the gift God gives is everlasting life by Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus, who was a perfect man, did not die for his own sins. He died for our sins. Jesus' death makes it possible for us to enjoy everlasting life and be blessed by God. 1 Peter 3.18 reads, Why, even Christ died once for all time concerning sins, a righteous person for unrighteous ones, that he might lead you to God, he being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. For more information, see chapters 4 and 5 of the book, What Does the Bible Really Teach?, published by Jehovah's Witnesses. End of article. Do you believe that you have lived before? The return to life is an actual fact, and it is a fact that the living are generated from the dead and that the souls of the dead exist. Plato, Greek philosopher, 5th century BCE, quoting Socrates. Since the soul is not found without body and yet is not body, it may be in one body or in another and pass from body to body. Giordano Bruno, Italian philosopher, 16th century CE. Nothing is dead. Men feign themselves dead, and there they stand looking out of the window, sound and well, in some new and strange disguise. Ralph Waldo Emerson, American essayist and poet, 19th century CE. Have you ever wondered who you really are? Have you ever imagined that you have lived before? If so, you are not alone. Since early times, people from both Eastern and Western cultures have pondered such questions. In their search for answers, some have turned to a belief called reincarnation. This is the idea that when a person dies, an intangible soul leaves the body and is reborn in another body, human, animal, or even plant, in one or more successive existences. While such a belief may satisfy some people, how can we be sure whether it is true? What does God's Word, the Bible, have to say about it? First, though, we must ask, where did the idea come from? Where did reincarnation originate? According to historians and scholars, the inhabitants of ancient Babylon, a city founded in the latter part of the 3rd millennium BCE, toyed with the idea of the immortality of the human soul. The problem of immortality engaged the serious attention of the Babylonian theologians, said Morris Jastrow, Jr., in his book, The Religion of Babylonia and Assyria. To the Babylonians, death was a passage to another kind of life, he explained. No doubt, the impossibility for the individual to conceive of himself as forever deprived of consciousness was at the bottom of the primitive theory of the perpetuity of existence in some form. From that beginning in Babylon, teachings on the transmigration and rebirth of the soul also began to develop in other parts of the ancient world. Indian philosophers formulated an elaborate belief system around a cycle of rebirths based on the law of cause and effect, or karma. Influential Greek philosophers also adopted the idea of reincarnation giving it wide appeal. Coming to our time, there has been a surge of interest in reincarnation in Western countries. Celebrities and the younger generation have become fascinated with Eastern religious ideas and practices. Today, there is a profusion of books and Internet sites that discuss the significance of supposed past life experiences. Fast becoming popular in many countries is what has been called past life therapy, it promotes the use of hypnosis to explore people's presumed previous lives in an effort to understand their present health and behavior patterns. Is reincarnation true? Even though belief in reincarnation has ancient roots, surely an answer is needed to the foremost question. Is it true? And Christians would want to know if that belief is consistent with Bible-based Christian faith. Since our Creator, Jehovah God, is the source of life and a revealer of secrets, He discloses things about life and death otherwise unknown to humans. Daniel 2, 28. 
we can confidently look to His Word, the Bible, for answers on the subject. God's answers can be easily identified when we allow the Bible to interpret itself. For example, at Genesis 3.19, we find God's words to Adam after Adam and Eve disobeyed him. God said, In the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam was created from the dust. At death he returned to the dust. That was God's clear statement on the matter. So at death, a person is not reborn as someone else, but ceases to exist. Just as heat and cold, dry and wet, light and dark are opposites, death is the opposite of life. The dead are really dead. Isn't that simple and logical? Recollections of past lives must therefore have other explanations. The workings of the human mind, including the subconscious, and the effects of medication or traumatic experiences are still not fully understood. Dreams and imagined events based on the colossal amount of information stored in the memory bank of the brain can be so vivid that they appear to be real. In some cases, wicked spirit forces create uncanny experiences that can make the unreal appear real. It is a natural human desire to want to live and to know about the future. But where did that desire come from? Interestingly, the Bible says regarding the Creator, He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Ecclesiastes 3.11, New International Version. Hence, humans have a heartfelt desire to live indefinitely. If our Creator, Jehovah God, has put the desire to live forever in the hearts of men, it is only logical that He would also explain how that desire can be satisfied. The Bible reveals the Creator's lofty purpose to bless obedient humans with everlasting life on a paradise earth. The righteous themselves will possess the earth, and they will reside forever upon it, said the inspired psalmist King David. Psalm 37, 29. A primary Bible doctrine inseparably linked with God's eternal purpose is the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection the proven hope for the dead. The Bible contains eight eyewitness accounts of people being raised from the dead back to life on earth. The footnote reads, The eight recorded instances are found at 1 Kings 17, 17-24, 2 Kings 4, 32-37, and 13, 20 and 21, Luke 7, 11-17, and 8, 40-56, John 11, 38 through 44, Acts 9, 36 through 42, and 20, 7 through 12. As you read the accounts, note how these resurrections took place in front of many eyewitnesses. A ninth account describes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. End of footnote. These were cases of resurrection, not reincarnation. The ones brought back from the dead were immediately recognized by family and friends. In no case did the relatives need to search among newborns near and far to try and ascertain if one of the infants was the reincarnated soul of their dead loved one. The following is supplementary information. A Superior Hope Rather than trying to piece together a doubtful framework of past life experiences shrouded in mystery, why not take time to examine the Bible's teaching on the resurrection? It provides truly satisfying answers now and great comfort in times of sadness. For example, Theodore was deeply grieved after losing Rosemary, his beloved wife of 44 years. He said, I know Rosemary is in the safest place possible, Jehovah's memory. The biblical accounts of the resurrection are so sure with so many witnesses to testify that they actually occurred, that I am waiting to hear Jesus say, as he did to Lazarus, Rosemary, come on out. Costas and Maria were tragically bereaved of their 20-month-old daughter because of a genetic disorder. Maria says, The death of Evie, our daughter, 
was truly painful. From that time on, we have had a much deeper understanding of suffering, death, and the resurrection. Bible verses such as Isaiah 33, 24 and 35, 5 and 6 and Revelation 21, 4 and 5 mean so much more to us. Yes, Jehovah has been a loving Father in giving us the sure hope of the resurrection. The Bible's answers to questions about life and death come directly from our Creator. Like Theodore, Costas, and Maria, you too can have a trustworthy hope for the future if you build it on the rock-like foundation of God's Word. It can never lie. Returning to the article, Reassuringly, God's Word indicates that the vast majority of those who have died will come back in the resurrection of the dead in God's new world, which will soon replace this wicked world here on earth. Right now, the life patterns of billions of individuals are preserved in the limitless, perfect memory of Jehovah, the God who even remembers the names of all the stars. When He restores successive generations of people to life in His new world, they will be able to trace their family tree and personally get to know their ancestors. What a fascinating, thrilling prospect. End of article. Did you know? Was Jesus in error when he spoke about salt losing its salinity? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his followers, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its strength, how will its saltness be restored? It is no longer usable for anything but to be thrown outside, to be trampled on by men. Matthew 5.13 Salt is a preservative. Hence, Jesus' illustration likely meant that his disciples could and should protect others from spiritual and moral decay. With regard to Jesus' comment about salt losing its salinity, however, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, The salt from the Dead Sea region was generally contaminated with other minerals. Thus the salt could be dissolved out of this mixture, leaving a tasteless substance. It is understandable, therefore, that Jesus described the residue as no longer usable for anything but to be thrown outside. Although its impurity made the salt from the Dead Sea inferior to most sea salts, the encyclopedia adds, its accessibility, it could simply be picked up along the shore, made it the main source of salt for Palestine. What meaning would the loss of a drachma coin in Jesus' parable have to his listeners? Jesus told the parable of a woman who, after losing one of the ten drachmas she possessed, took a lamp and swept her house carefully until she found it again. In Jesus' day, a drachma was worth almost a day's wage, so the monetary loss Jesus illustrated was not trivial. Yet, the scene he described was true to life for other reasons. Some reference works indicate that women often used coins as ornaments. Jesus may thus have alluded to a coin that was part of a cherished heirloom or part of a woman's dowry. Whether this was the case or not, losing one of her ten coins would understandably make the woman extremely anxious to recover it. The houses of common people in Jesus' day, moreover, were designed to keep out as much light and heat as possible. They had few, if any, windows. The floors were usually covered with straw or dried stems of various plants. If a coin was dropped, it would be hard to find. Hence, says one commentator, when a comparatively small article, like a piece of money, was lost in such a place, the lighting of a lamp and the sweeping of the house were the most natural means to be used for its recovery. End of article. A letter from Benin. What did I get myself into? It was a typical West African morning. The aroma of boiling sauces and rice wafted through the air. Women walked by with unbelievable loads balanced on their heads. The sound of hearty laughter mingled with fierce bargaining. The sun quickly whitened into a blaze. Upon seeing a yovo, or white person, a group of children swung into their usual song and dance. The song started with, Yovo, yovo, bonsoir, and ended with, 
how about a gift for the performance? One boy was not singing. As I continued on my way, he followed me and began to gesture with his hands. It looked like sign language. In the United States, I had learned to spell in American Sign Language, or ASL, but Benin is a French-speaking country. I struggled to sign the eight letters of my name. The boy's face exploded into a smile. He grabbed my hand and guided me through some narrow streets to his home, a typical two-room cinderblock dwelling. His family flocked around. Everyone was signing. Now what? I signed my name and then wrote a note saying that I was a missionary who taught the Bible and that I would come back. Some hearing neighbors joined in, all nodding approval. What did I get myself into, I thought. Back home, I pondered. There must be someone who could help these people learn about God's promise. The very ears of the deaf ones will be unstopped. Isaiah 35, 5 I did some research. A recent census had counted 12,000 known deaf and hard of hearing people in Benin. My eyes widened when I discovered that ASL, not French Sign Language, was used in the schools for the deaf. But how sad to find that not one of Jehovah's Witnesses here knew ASL. Sighing, I said to a local witness, I wish someone who knew ASL would come and help. She replied, You're here, aren't you? She was right. I ordered a self-help book and the DVDs in ASL published by Jehovah's Witnesses. My prayers for help were answered when a witness who knew ASL well moved from Cameroon to Benin. Word of my endeavor spread. I was told I should visit Brice, a sign painter. His atelier, or workshop, made of palm fronds sewn together, was refreshingly airy in the steamy climate. Years of his cleaning paintbrushes had given the walls a rainbow of colors. He dusted off a couple of stools and stared at me, waiting for me to begin. I slid a DVD into my portable player. He dragged his stool closer to the small screen. I understand, I understand, he signed. Neighborhood children gathered and craned their necks to see. One blurted out, Why are they watching a movie without sound? Each time I returned to see Brees, the huddle around the DVD player grew larger. Soon, Brees and others began coming to our Christian meetings. Trying to interpret for them aided my progress. As the group grew, some even came looking for me. For example, one day my old car grunted and groaned in protest as I hit potholes while trying to avoid stray goats and pigs. Then there was a sudden bang from the rear. Oh no, I thought to myself, not another breakdown. No, it was a deaf man running after my car and trying to get my attention the best way he could, by banging on my car. ASL groups developed in other cities. When sign language sessions were organized at our annual convention, I was among those asked to interpret. As I stepped onto the platform and waited for the speaker to begin, for a moment my thoughts went back to when I first started in my assignment. I used to think, what more could I do as a missionary in Africa? Looking at the audience, I knew that I had found the answer, be a missionary who helps the deaf. I no longer ask myself, what did I get myself into? End of article. The Use of Cosmetics in Bible Times After bathing, the woman applies some fragrant oil over her softened skin. Then she opens a colorfully ornamented box that contains a collection of small bottles, vases, and jars made of glass, ivory, shell, or stone. In them she has an assortment of oils and perfumes that are delicately scented with balsam, cardamom, cinnamon, frankincense, honey, myrrh, and the like. From the box, the woman takes out several delicately shaped spoons, dishes, and bowls. Using them, she mixes the cosmetics she has chosen for the day. Peering into a bronze mirror, she carefully proceeds with her beauty regimen. It seems that since the earliest of times, women have been very interested in making themselves beautiful. Early tomb paintings, frescoes, and mosaics 
all suggest that the use of cosmetics was widespread among people in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. The heavily made-up, almond-shaped eyes seen on images of Egyptian women were much admired. What, though, about the Israelites? Did women of ancient Israel use cosmetics? And if so, what kind? There are, of course, no tomb paintings or frescoes from ancient Israel that we can refer to. But certain accounts in the Bible, along with various archaeological artifacts unearthed in Bible lands, can provide at least a glimpse of the use of cosmetics in Bible times. The Tools Used Countless items linked to the use of cosmetics and perfumes have been unearthed in excavations throughout the land of Israel. Stone bowls or palettes for grinding and mixing cosmetic materials, carrot-shaped perfume bottles, alabaster ointment jars, and hand mirrors of polished bronze were among the finds. One ivory spoon has carved palm leaves on one side of its handle and a woman's head flanked by doves on the other. Decorated shells appear to have been popular cosmetic containers among the well-to-do. Tiny cosmetic spoons made of ivory or wood, some carved in the form of girls swimming and various other intricate designs, have also been found in Egypt and at Canaanite sites. All of this testifies to the extent of the use of cosmetics by women of that time. For the Eyes In the Bible, one of Job's daughters is named Karen Hepek. In Hebrew, this name could mean horn of the black eye paint, that is, a receptacle or box used to store makeup, perhaps coal or eye makeup. The name could have alluded to her beauty in general, but it also seems to suggest that the use of cosmetics was known at that time. Significantly, Biblical references to eye painting are always connected with such notorious women as the scheming Queen Jezebel and unfaithful Jerusalem, portrayed as a prostitute by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Judging by the large number of glass or stone containers with tiny wands for applying coal eyeliner that have been unearthed, it is evident that many women in apostate Israel, particularly those of royalty and the rich, had taken up the practice of decorating themselves heavily with eyeliner and other kinds of cosmetics. Perfumed Oil for Sacred or Secular Use The production and use of olive oil-based perfumes has a long history in ancient Israel. The Bible book of Exodus contains a recipe for making the sacred perfumed oil used by the priests in their services at the temple. It is a blend of cinnamon, myrrh, and other aromatic plants. In Jerusalem, archaeologists have found what they believe to be a first-century CE workshop where perfume and incense were produced for use at the temple. There are many biblical references to perfumed oil used in both sacred services and everyday life. Water was scarce in that part of the world, so scented oils were a welcome addition to the hygiene routine. Oil was used not only for protection of the skin in the hot, dry climate, but also for its cosmetic benefits. The Jewish maiden Esther, before being presented to King Ahasuerus, received a 12-month spa treatment, a 6-month massage with oil of myrrh, and then another 6-month treatment with balsam oil. Perfumes or perfumed oils were a valued commodity on a par with silver and gold. When the Queen of Sheba made her epic journey to visit King Solomon, the valuable gifts she brought included gold, precious stones, and balsam oil. When King Hezekiah showed the treasures of his house to envoys from Babylon, the balsam oil and the good oil were proudly displayed alongside the silver, the gold, and his entire armory. Isaiah 39, 1 and 2 only tiny amounts of perfume or oil could be extracted from the various flowers, fruits, leaves, resins, or bark. The Bible mentions a number of these aromatic plants, such as aloe, balsam, delium gum, calamus, cassia, cinnamon, frankincense, myrrh, saffron, and spikenard. Some of them were indigenous and grew in the Jordan Valley. 
Others were imported by way of the legendary incense trade routes from India, South Arabia, and elsewhere. The Enigmatic Balsam Oil Balsam oil is mentioned in the Bible in the accounts about Queen Esther, the Queen of Sheba, and King Hezekiah, as noted earlier. In 1988, a small jug of oil was discovered in a cave near Qumran, on the western shore of the Dead Sea. It raised much speculation. Was this the last remaining sample of the famous balsam oil? Researchers have no conclusive answer. Down to this day, growers are trying to re-establish the once-renowned balsam groves. Evidence seems to bear out that the balsam oil mentioned in the Bible was cultivated in the area around Engidai. Excavations have uncovered furnaces, jars, and various metal and bone objects, dating from the 6th century BCE, similar to those used in other areas for perfume making. Most scholars believe that the balsam bush originally came from Arabia or Africa. The fragrance was produced from the sap. Balsam oil was so highly prized that the methods of cultivation and production were kept secret. Balsam was even used as a bargaining tool in political maneuvers. For example, according to the historian Josephus, Mark Antony obtained an entire grove of these precious plants and offered them as a gift to the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. The Roman historian Pliny mentioned that during the Jewish war in the first century CE, Jewish fighters attempted to destroy all the balsam plants to prevent the conquering Romans from taking them. From Bible references and archaeological discoveries, we are able to get a glimpse of the art of cosmetic use among the people of Bible times. Rather than condemning the use of cosmetics and other adornment, the Bible emphasizes that they be used in modesty and with soundness of mind. The Apostle Peter pointed out that what is of great value in the eyes of God is the quiet and mild spirit. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 in view of ever-changing styles and fashions, this surely is fine advice for Christian women, young and old. End of article History Does Not Lie On June 14, 2007, the Estonian National Post Office issued a commemorative postage stamp. The release was accompanied by an announcement. This souvenir sheet was issued to commemorate victims of the Stalinist genocide of the Estonians. Between 1941 and 1951, tens of thousands of Estonians were forcibly deported. History does not lie. That is a well-known saying in Estonia, and there are similar sayings in other lands. Yes, we cannot change the past, but we can certainly learn from it. Wise King Solomon of ancient Israel said, I saw all this when I thought about the things that are done in this world, a world where some men have power and others have to suffer under them. Ecclesiastes 8.9, today's English version. A powerful testimony to the truth of this biblical statement was seen some decades ago in Estonia, as well as in many other parts of Eastern Europe. Human rule brought suffering to countless innocent people who were forcibly deported to faraway places to be resettled or imprisoned in labor camps. According to local historians, more than 46,000 civilians were deported from this small country between 1941 and 1951. Most were targeted for their political affiliation, others for their nationality or social status. Jehovah's Witnesses, however, were singled out for their religious beliefs. Attack on God-fearing people In a study published by Tartu University Press in 2004, Historian Aigi Rahitam stated, From 1948 to 1951, 72 of Jehovah's Witnesses were arrested, including people associated with them. However, a deportation on a far wider scale was planned and carried out on the night of April 1, 1951, not just in the Baltic states, but also in Moldova, western Ukraine, and Belarusia. Before 1951, Jehovah's Witnesses in Estonia were subjected to arrest, psychological pressure, interrogation, and imprisonment. 
This new campaign of deportation was apparently an all-out effort to wipe Jehovah's Witnesses out of Estonia altogether. The date, April 1, 1951, appears on the stamp mentioned earlier. The number 382 on the stamp refers to the number of witnesses and their children who were deported on that day. This number includes some relatives and neighbors who were not witnesses. During the day, arrests were made throughout the country. That night, those arrested, young and old, were herded into animal boxcars on trains headed for Siberia. Ella Tome, 25 years old at the time, was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Recalling a typical interrogation, she says, An officer tried to frighten me and demanded that I stop preaching. Once he asked, Do you want to live or do you want to die with your God on the fields of Siberia? Ella, however, fearlessly continued to preach the good news. She was sent to Siberia and was transferred from one labor camp to another over a period of almost six years. Among the hundreds of individuals who were deported without a court hearing was another young witness woman, Hesi Lember. Recalling the events of April 1, 1951, she related, They came totally unexpectedly at night, ordering us, You have half an hour. Pack your things. Under the cover of darkness, Hesi and her six-year-old daughter were then taken to the train station. The creaky train traveled from station to station and picked up more witnesses. We were thrown into an animal boxcar. Thankfully, the animal dung was frozen. Otherwise, it would have been difficult to stand in it. We were like animals stuffed into a container. The grueling two-week train trip was traumatic. The boxcars were overcrowded and unsanitary. Young and old were humiliated and disgraced in every possible way. Some of them wept and refused to eat. However, the witnesses encouraged and helped one another by singing songs of worship, and they shared what food they had. They were sent to a permanent settlement and were told that this was a one-way trip. Hesi recalled the heartwarming support that she received from fellow believers during this ordeal. At one station, our train stopped next to a train from Moldova. Through the wall of the boxcar, we heard a man ask who we were and where we were going. We explained that we didn't know where we were going and that we were Jehovah's Witnesses from Estonia. Fellow witnesses in the train from Moldova overheard the conversation. Through an opening in the boxcar, they threw us a big loaf of bread and some prunes. She added, Then we began to understand the extent of the roundup of Jehovah's Witnesses, that it was from all the republics of the Soviet Union. Two teenage witness girls, Corinna and her sister Enna, were separated from their mother for more than six years. Their mother, also one of Jehovah's Witnesses, had been arrested earlier and sent to a labor camp. Then, on that infamous April night, the two young girls were snatched from their home and herded into a boxcar. Corinna reflects with thankfulness. On the train, a witness with two children offered to care for us and assured us that we could live together as a family with her and her children. What happened at the final destination? The day after reaching the cold Siberian wilderness, a humiliating slave market began. Men from nearby collective farms came to choose workers for their farms. Corinna recalls, We overheard them bickering among themselves, saying, You already have a driver for your tractor. This one is mine. Or, I already took two old ones. You have to take some old ones too. Corinna and Enna were brave girls. They said later, We missed our mother very much, and oh, how we yearned just to be in her warm embrace again. Even so, they maintained their spiritual strength and sense of humor. Corinna added, In a way, it was good that mother did not see us because sometimes we had to work outside in the bitter cold without proper clothing. To be sure, innocent people in Estonia and elsewhere have suffered gross injustice, and Jehovah's Witnesses as a group have been among them. Despite such mistreatment and suffering in the past, Jehovah's Witnesses in Estonia are still an active and happy group of people. The following is supplementary information. Unimaginable Scale of Terror It is impossible to grasp the scale of terror that swept across the country, millions of ruined lives. For people were executed without trial or record. For people were exiled and sent to concentration camps. 
deprived of civil rights for having the wrong occupation or the improper social origins. Let's just think about it. Millions of people died because of terror and false accusations. President Medvedev of the Russian Federation, October 30th, 2009. Returning to the article. A bright future ahead. The Bible assures us that Jehovah God hates injustice. It says, Everyone doing these things, every doer of injustice, is something detestable to Jehovah your God. Deuteronomy 25, 16. Though God has tolerated wickedness in the past, the time will soon come when he will bring injustice and wickedness to an end. Just a little while longer, says the psalmist, and the wicked one will be no more. And you will certainly give attention to his place, and he will not be. But the meek ones themselves will possess the earth, and they will indeed find their exquisite delight in the abundance of peace. Psalm 37, 10 and 11. Yes, a bright future awaits us. Though we cannot change the past, we can take steps to assure our future. Draw close to God and see how you can be part of the wonderful future when true righteousness will prevail. End of article.